and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership series. My name is Scott Miller, and I'm privileged to serve as your ongoing host and interviewer. Now, today marks the 20th episode of our On Leadership series, and we're delighted to all of you that are subscribing to it. If you're seeing this in a different venue or in a podcast format or in some other way, we really encourage you to subscribe to the weekly series. It's free. It comes out every Tuesday via email. And you're encouraged to go to franklincovey.com and click on the On Leadership tab and subscribe. Also, invite your friends, your colleagues, your family members. We'd love everyone to be joining these rich dialogues. To that point, we've had some fantastic conversations in the last three months or so. We've had the enormous privilege to interview CEOs, thought leaders, best-selling authors, visionaries, and really practical practitioners, if you will, of leadership concepts all of us need to have in our roles as leaders, not just at work, but at home with our families as well. We've talked with such luminaries as Liz Wiseman, this, the best-selling author of the book Multipliers, talking about are you multiplying or are you diminishing your people? Fantastic book, pick it up if you haven't read it. We also interviewed Susan Cain, the expert speaker and author researcher around introverts and the power and unleashed talent of some introverts in the workplace and how extroverts and introverts, introverts can work so well together. We've interviewed Seth Godin, the seminal mind around marketing and branding and influence, really a leadership expert in his own right. If you aren't subscribing to Seth Godin's blog, you need to be. It's daily via email. Go to sethgodin.com and subscribe. We've talked with the amazing, amazing visionary and researcher, Daniel Pink, and some of our own internal experts, Stephen M. R. Covey on trust, Chris McChesney on execution, Todd Davis, Corey Kogan, Lena Renee, this cadre of experts that we bring to you every week. And today is no different. I am actually so excited about today's conversation because our two experts for the first time on leadership are joining us today from their home in the San Francisco Bay Area. They are David Sibbett and Gisela Vintling, who've co-authored this new book called Visual Consulting, the fourth in an amazing series that I discovered about 10 years ago we have them both on camera today in a unique format where David is going to talk about some graphic facilitation skills, how those can bring to life conversation and dialogue. And his wife and co-author, Gisela, will talk also around how do organizations deal with change? How can visualization, conversation, dialogue, engagement help to manage through that process? What is a leader's role in the change process? And today I'm delighted to introduce them both. Both. First, David Sibbett, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you, Scott. It's good to see you again. It's great to have you here, David. You and I have been friends now for the better part of a decade. We've had some collaborations, and I think the skill that you have launched around the world, gosh, you know, 30, 40 years ago is, is never needed more than now in terms of graphic facilitation and really visual illumination. And we're also joined today by your co-author and wife, Gisela Vintling. Gisela, welcome also to On Leadership. Mm, thank you, Scott. Great to have you here. I think you're both in the same house, but in different rooms. So today our format is going to toggle between both of them. We'll have some dialogue back and forth. And as I mentioned, David is going to do some work at the whiteboard as well. So David, I'd like to start first with you. So your original book, one of the original books in this series was Visual Meetings. As you can see, I've had this book for the better part of, a, I think, almost a decade. Some great topics in here. The, the reason why I fell in love with your book, Visual Meetings, was because like many of our audience today, as a leader, as a speaker, I am facilitating lots of conversations, some internally, some externally, a lot of public speaking. But at the end of the day, when I'm asked to get up at a whiteboard, or a chart pad or a poster and express my ideas in handwriting or capture ideas from the room, my credibility always lessens, David. I'm a fairly <laughs> adequate speaker and I usually know the content I'm talking about sufficiently well. But when it comes time to actually get up to a chart pad and take notes or capture things in kind of a high stakes meeting, I have typically lacked the penmanship, the skills, the deliberation to capture and you have beautifully taught millions of professionals the art of visual graphic facilitation. So I'd like to start, David, with some simple skills that you teach. Before we have those, I want to tell us your journey. How did you kind of invent and uncover this art, and what led you to this series of such powerful books? <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, I was actually uh, trained in journalism, but have always been good at drawing. And we happened to be, when I was doing leadership development with an organization called Coro, uh, next to a consulting firm that was professionalizing facilitation for business in the 1970s. And they had a model of facilitator recorder. And so I would do this facilitation recording on very large sheets of paper and found out it just transformed the seminars that we had mm -hmm. uh, where the, the fellows in Coro were trying to understand how cities work. And one thing led to another and we were really at the ground floor of um, a lot of the developments of Silicon Valley. And as uh, new technologies of visualization came on and more companies were starting up, uh, we were right there at the right time and have been training people since the mid 70s in this way of working. You know, David, I think this is one of your seminal books. Uh, it's one that I've seen on the desks of hundreds of clients around the nation. I, I mentioned to you before we came on camera that our set is made up of some of my favorite 200 leadership books and all of yours got a space on the wall. You've written uh, now four books, so Visual Leaders, yeah. Visual Teams, Visual Meetings. Your newest book out with your co-author, um, uh, Gisela, is Visual Consulting. The finest compliment I can pay you was just yesterday, a senior design associate from the Duarte firm. We had Nancy right. Duarte on our program a few weeks ago. And as I picked her up at the airport, I had your book, Visual Consulting, in my car. And just yesterday, she said Nancy Duarte bought the book for every member of her team. And I oh, think wonderful. they're one of the top design firms in the world. Yeah. So what a compliment that Nancy Duarte is buying your and your wife's book for all of, um, of her staff members as well. So I'm excited to launch into that as well. She does fine work. She does, and she's very complimentary of yours as well. Okay, let's get tactical. Uh, for facilitators out there, which all of us are facilitators at some point, regardless of our formal title or not, you have a concept called seven basic figures and seven basic frames. And they're very yeah. easy to learn icons that anybody can use at different deliberate times in a, in a meeting, in a seminar, in a work session. Dave, would you yes. take a couple of minutes and walk us through the value of knowing and practicing first the seven basic figures? Sure, and I'm, I'm sitting at a Wacom tablet here, and one of the reasons we're meeting this way is we conduct a lot of forums internationally now in our Global Learning and Exchange Network, where I'm using the, this very same graphics that we've been working with for years on white paper. And so the, what I'm gonna be sharing here is um, exactly what we've discovered. And what we've discovered is that graphics is basically um, adding a pen to gesture. And a human being is basically an upright person that's very oriented to gravity. So we've turned out that um, there, are, there are basic uh, movements that you can make that are all based on the way we relate to, to level. And one is teaching people how to do uh, just a drop line. A drop line is just using gravity to drop a line. And if you stand at a board and follow gravity, you'll do that. The second would be the horizon line where you imagine that this is a picture and you draw across like this as though you're looking through a window and you're looking at the ocean or you're looking at the prairie, something like that. So the horizon line would be the second one. And the third would be um, if you want to draw all the other angles, you put a pen on the paper, pick a point to look at, and throw the line. This is called a throw line. Now, it turns out that drop lines, horizon lines, and throw lines make up all the different shapes that you want to do. So a pyramid would be a little throw line base up to the point down to the base. Um, a, a square would be a drop line, horizon line, horizon line, drop line. You add the two together and you get a hollow arrow. So you already begin to get a vocabulary. The next ones are that your arm here is on a pivot and actually can make a circle very easily if you think about it as stirring. So making a circle is a process of kind of looking at the center and just stirring round and round. And most people can make a perfect circle with very minimal teaching. If you uh, then <laughs> add a second instruction, which is go round and round and get smaller, you get a spiral. 
And if you then throw the wine in a curve like this, you get uh, basically all of your curved lines and you're basically throwing a curve. So here you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. And the seventh I probably should have said at the beginning, which is the bullet. And uh, the bullet points are actually little versions of these things. So you have little versions of these as a star, little versions as a square, a circle that's filled in, uh, another little star. So these seven basic movements, I call them figures, um, but they're really body movements, build up the entire vocabulary of graphics. And we found that in, in less than an hour, we can get people to personally experience in their bodies how to do these, and their level of capability just jumps, uh, skyrockets just in one training session. David, great demonstration of those seven basic figures. I've used them countless times since then. And if I'm, I find that when I'm facilitating a meeting or a work session, I'm just calm and deliberate. When I walk to the board and I think about the seven basic figures that David taught me and you taught in your book, Visual Meetings, that I'm much more credible, that my credibility, I think, becomes um, higher versus lower when I'm able to have some skills, some tools to draw upon. So like the seven basic figures, you also have seven basic frames, ways to organize information based on what you're capturing, what your end in mind is, what you're being taught. Would you spend some time also illustrating and teaching us those seven basic frames? Sure. Uh, let me go back to my chart here, and I'm going to a second page here. Um, this is a typical small meeting, and where this whole work started is um, you would have somebody in a meeting who uh, is basically uh, talking, and they're saying something, and the facilitator is then listening to what they're saying, and then making a choice here in my inner mind of how am I going to record this so that what the person is actually trying to say, which is the meaning of it, gets reflected back to the people in the room. Now, the choices, it, it's impossible to begin marking on it without making some choice. So it turns out there are seven choices that you have if you're working big on a wall. The first is to just make a simple single icon of some sort, a little drawing, you might say. And this little icon does functions as something that just focuses your eye. So this is mostly used for titling uh, or for something sitting out in the hallway as you're coming into a meeting or something that's a poster to show what the meeting is about, maybe the purpose of the meeting. Now, if you don't know what people are gonna say, you've gotta choose between a list or a cluster. And this is kind of almost a left brain, right brain kind of thing. A list is just a linear sequencing of what people say. And what's great about it is nobody thinks you're adding any structure to it. They can just read down it. You can see what was said first, second, and third. And so a lot of the art of that has to do with how you do these bullets and learning how to write straight. A cluster is where you, probably the metaphor that works best is the sticky note. A cluster is where you're spacing information in little chunks. Sometimes uh, those, it comes out as little popcorn kind of little clusters of stuff that you've written. And what this does is it activates people's thinking because it's impossible to look at a cluster without starting to triangulate and compare what's going on. So this activates uh, thinking, this sort of engages the flow of the meeting. The third choice is to actually put stuff in a grid and consultants use four box models, many different kinds where you have several categories that work like uh, new product, old product, new market, old market product. And where are you going to put your energy? Now, for a grid to work, you have to be very clear about what the categories are, but you are basically building understanding by crossing categories. And uh, 
if the group understands the categories, this can be a very powerful way to kind of analyze something. Now, you'll notice that these are building in complexity. The simple ones can actually nest inside of the more comprehensive ones. Over here on the right are the three that are the most comprehensive. A diagram is where you have something central like a mind map and you begin branching out from it all of the related things. But unlike the cluster, you're connecting everything. So many, many things show and the basic structure is you're branching what you're doing. They, you grow um, understanding when you do a diagram, just like a tree would grow. You start at the beginning and you push it out. So there are actually many specific versions of this, like in total quality management, you might do a fishbone diagram. A drawing, and this was the big uh, kind of innovation that at the Grove Consultants we made. The drawing is where you add a uh, metaphor to what's going on. Uh, a metaphor would be an analogy of some sort. So I've got this partially obscured here by my other things. So let me go up here. Metaphor would be, if I have a chart like this, the landscape would be a metaphor. So I might say, here's the sunrise over here, which is our vision. Here's the path to the vision. There are gonna be some challenges that come in along the way. And I can put stuff up in the, in the atmosphere here, and maybe there are some values that provide kind of a win. Well, this landscape metaphor animates a drawing in a way that just having it conceptually laid out can never do. So drawing is where you overlay a metaphor on a diagram, a grid, or a cluster. And finally, a mandala simply is putting everything around a unified center. And a mandala can show clusters, it can show lists, and it is the symbol, this is a Sanskrit word for archetype, basically. And so this shows unity. And if you master these seven formats or frameworks, uh, you can handle practically, you can handle any kind of meeting. And a lot of the art of graphic facilitation is matching the purposes that the people have in the meeting with the right kind of display. David, we could end the interview right here because I think that skill is in itself just a webcast, right? It's its, it's, it's, its own value. The seven frame, seven figures has transformed the way I and other consultants here organize data. I think it's just a universal leadership skill for anybody who's trying to bring large scale visualization to a meeting. Uh, I'd love to have your co-author and your wife, um, Gizila, weigh in, although you don't profess to be an expert artist like your husband, you have a lot of insight and expertise around the power of visualization in meetings and in change management. Would you weigh in, Gazila, on why do you think this function plays such a crucial role when it comes to leading people through visioning, missioning processes and change management? Yes, I certainly would. Um, being an organization development consultant and change consultant and having worked with groups and organizations over decades, I find that working visually is very helpful to uh, help the group think systemically and think outside of the box. What happens is that once you begin to collect the information in the third space on the wall, the collective thinking of the group is captured and they can reference back to it. And it allows for, uh, for example, for paradoxical thinking to be present at the same time. Two opposing points of view are in the same space and that makes it easier to explore. So one uh, participant might be thinking about their own perspectives and then can reference the board to check out, oh, this is what the group is thinking and therefore shift their perspective. You know, I, I'm going to build on that. And David, I may have you weigh in. Um, at Franklin Covey, we have a lot of smart people, right? Uh, I, I'm going to deem them so. And we're in meetings all day long where there are four or five or six chart pads worth of notes, and we either roll them up and transcribe them or we take photographs mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. But none of them look like this, right? There's no thought. It's just brainstorming and lists. And as I think about the outcomes of our meetings, 
the, the thoughtfulness that would come after the meeting, if it looked like this, it would be you know, palpably different. I have to think that organizations who hire you, The Grove, the name mm -hmm. of your company, to come in and consult this way, see not just more engagement in the meeting, but they see mm -hmm. probably more definitive next steps, more action items come out of the meeting because mm -hmm. these visuals are seared into their memory That's as true. they're you know, moving to next steps. Is that true? Well, you're actually, yes, you do have an output that is tangible, uh, really helps with follow through, helps with memory. They're, that's what, how we build our entire business was on this capability. But there are actually two outputs you need if you're going to actually implement strategies or have actual change in an organization. Yes, you need clarity of understanding. You need a lot of agreement on the larger system view of what's happening. But the second thing you need is you need people to care about each other and actually trust each other in implementing this stuff. Now, this comes in the process of creating these visuals in the exchanges that happen in the meeting. In the last three years, uh, after you know many decades of being quite successful just managing information on the wall with people, uh, I've begun to work with Gisela, and the kinds of things that happen in the meeting are so much richer and deeper when you really have sensitive dialogue, you leave time for conversation. And basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to release a new narrative or a new story into the, into the life of the, and the culture of the organization through conversation. And so in some ways it's almost reversing the purposes of graphics, not to push information, but really to be yeah. a space and a holder for the conversations out of which grow the story, which is where the real power is. You might say something more about this, Gisela. This is very important. I think it's the combination truly of both, is, is the having the visual capture and having the visual actually stimulate new thinking. And with the more dialogic approach is really having the attention on also the people in the room and connecting with each other and hearing each other's perspective. So, you know, when we relate to each other in meetings, we relate on so many more levels than just thinking. We relate on the level of emotions. We relate on the level of trust. We relate on um, uh, the, the level of vision. And uh, by having people deeply listening to one another and connecting that way, the, the, something else can happen. You know, in meetings, as you know, it's not always just brainstorming and gathering new information. You know, the, in meetings, there's often um, where, where we are collecting information and expanding the knowledge base, but eventually we have to also bring all of that information together and make decisions. And um, so that is, a, so more needs to happen than the collection of information. And we actually need to funnel the information in such a way that we can make decisions. And that happens in the interaction that people have with one another and the role of the leader in those meetings, uh, the kind of decision-making models that need to be, that the members need to be clear about. So there are many facets to making uh, a meeting really successful. Gisela, you are, your, your credentials are impeccable. You are you know, an organizational design expert. You understand change management extremely well. You're not a professed artist like your husband co-author is. But I'll bet, and I know, you've led, facilitated, coached thousands of meetings, retreats, experiences in your career. Let me ask you a practical question. Are there some, are there some best practices that come immediately to mind on what makes for a great meeting, regardless of the topic. When you've got you know, a group of leaders assembled, perhaps for a day or two, are there some process successes or there are some environmental commonalities that you'd say, when you're gonna have executives together or leaders together for an all-day meeting, do this, do this, don't do that. Anything that comes to mind you might share with us? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So what comes to mind is I really love to have a really good agenda design. <clears throat> and I like to spend quite a bit of time actually ahead of time really thinking through each part of it. But now meetings are very dynamic and you can't really predict them. So for me, it's like knowing one way it could work sets me kind of up to being very flexible in the moment. So it's kind of paradoxical. So that's, but that's part of my uh, strategy. I'm also um, thinking about 
the leader and uh, how helpful it is to be on board uh, with the leader about what is going to happen. So when we design meetings, we make sure that the leader fully understands what the design looks like, what their role is in the meeting, that they empower us or empower me to be the facilitator and that they understand what their role is. So there's a lot of preparing ahead of time before we are stepping into. Uh, another aspect is if this is a, a, a content heavy meeting and decisions need to be made, I would always advocate for, uh, for interviewing all of the participants ahead of time so that we know that the agenda we are creating is really going into the direction and the needs of the participants. Only contracting and talking to one or two people, in particular the leaders, is often not enough to fully understand the complexity that are truly a part of the meeting. So there's a lot of work ahead of time, I think, to have a powerful, fun day meeting. David, and, uh, David, why don't you um, yeah, share David, some would you would you add to well? that? Because in the book, you actually have a wealth of knowledge just beyond you know the visual aspect. You talk about sort of the democracy of table setup and the the benefit of having a U table. David, talk a little more also practically around what are some environmental aspects that make for a great environment? Well, one of the things that we're writing about in visual consulting, uh, the subtitle is Designing and Leading Change, is that what you're doing is you're providing a series of, the metaphor would be containers for people to have the kinds of conversations they need to have to break down the old ideas and break through to new ideas. So the room itself is a physical container and in some ways a metaphor for how you're going to be related. So having a meeting with no tables and sitting in a circle signals that you want to have a different kind of a meeting than the regular kind of a meeting you might be having to regulate staff and check on projects and do other stuff. So using the meeting venue, the actual physical space, as a graphic that signals the kind of behavior that you want to have in the meeting starts giving you much more repertoire. The thing that most leaders uh, underestimate is the need to have very well-designed special meetings that interrupt the habitual way people meet and staff uh, kinds of meetings. So this is why people, why many organizations have special retreats, special planning offsites, things like this. Well, when you're designing those, the physical environment makes all the difference. Uh, I'll just tell you, when I was working with Apple Computer, uh, we were training leaders there how to be leaders rather than managers. We actually embedded the whole meeting in the metaphor of an expedition. And we had them walk into an empty room at Pajaro Dunes with all the furniture piled up with parachutes over them looking like mountains. We then played a multimedia slide of the of a show of the Climb Up K2. Jim Whitaker would come out, talk about why teaming is like mountain climbing. And we would then ask everybody in the group to set up their base camp by unpacking the mound of furniture and making their own meeting venue. Well, this, by using the physical environment as a metaphor, we just totally got the meeting started on the right track. We even had the agenda on the wall as a climb up a mountain from base camp to base camp. David, build on that for a minute also. Um, tactically, what advice would you give facilitators, you know, leaders who are facilitating meetings, facilitators who are certified in you know, a Franklin Covey content or some content they've developed on their own, and they're in the work session, the seminar, the workshop, and they're at the chart pad of the whiteboard. What are some tips you might give on uh, how big your letters should be and what color pens <laughs> to use for different concepts? You must have kind of a quick litany of things, do's and don'ts around that. Yeah, well, the most important thing is to, I think of uh, the meeting over a period of a couple of hours or even a half day or a day, uh, you want to be able to look around the room and, and easily see what you were working on at different segments. So titling is really critical and you have to make the letters pretty big, like, you know, four or five <laughs> inches tall. Um, the next thing is, um, I think I got this from journalism, is you really want to have a series of headlines and features so that when people look, they can remember a whole chunk. So chunking up the information and titling it, subtitling it with headlines that actually capture some of the content. Um, these are all 
things that then allow you to hang a lot of detail if you get those two things right on it. Uh, another tip I would say is you've got to think about the visual environment almost like uh, theater staging. You're, you're staging understanding and where you put the charts on the wall and making it so people can kind of sweep through a panorama. It gets you into the kind of thing Gisela was talking about, which is uh, people going back, digging deeper, starting to see connections, seeing how seemingly opposite things actually work together. Um, and all of this um, is very doable right away when you start working this way, but with practice, you get more and more skillful. And a lot of the objective is to kind of uh, make it possible for the energy of the group to focus on what they need to work on. Uh, so the more easy you can look at the charts, the more you figured out, is there enough room for breakouts, all those kinds of details. Um, you're building containers for thinking and conceptual containers for breakthrough thinking and meaning. Most of the people doing design thinking and innovation work now uh, all work visually this way. Right. Gazila, your book is going to become the Bible of visual consulting. It's really this, you know, massive resource around not just mm -hmm. the visual aspect, but also, you know, process as well. It, you have a lot of great tips in the book. One talks about the four types of resistance in, in meetings mm -hmm. and such. Would you walk us through those? They are called disagreement with purpose, emotional fear of personal impact, not mm -hmm. enough information and the wrong leader. Spend a couple seconds on each of those, if you will. Sure enough. Um, I think, first of all, we need to understand that resistance is a very natural response to change. And um, because change brings about uncertainty and ambiguity, and while we might be excited about stepping into a change, we also know, almost viscerally, that we don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. So particularly when there is a change that is that is uh, somebody hasn't chosen and they're confronted with, uh, resistance becomes even higher and therefore it's really important to work with this. So what people, when resistance shows up, when they, not have, when they don't have enough information actually about what's going on, they don't understand enough or not enough information is being communicated. So or they experience the change as being out of context of what they are seeing is going on. The, th the second one is about um, they are becoming emotionally challenged by the change, which means something is at stake for them. Some, something is going to, there's, often, there's usually some kind of letting go of the old before we can actually change to welcome the new. And often at the beginning of change, it's not very clear what it is that, might, that we might need to let go of. So therefore, there is some, you know, some emotional um, reluctancy or concern. And um, so actually, the, the right strategy to address that is to, uh, particularly when we do large organizational change, is to involve stakeholders in, in understanding what the change is about and, and sharing their concerns about it, but also then tapping into their, their vision of what the change could be and, and sort of transforming their reluctance into actually buying into what the change can create. And then there is the, um, the third one, which is the, uh, the wrong leader, we say. So the leader plays a very important role as being the advocate of the change, as the one who will bring the new change about. If that leader has um, failed, so to speak, before, or there is a sense of not being able to trust the leader, that needs to be somehow addressed, either directly and openly, or sometimes leaders have to be replaced because they are just don't uh, gain the support of the stakeholders to move the change through. And then finally, you know, we might just simply disagree with what the purpose is of the change, and we have a different perspective on it. And so that's then the opportunity for creating dialogue. So what does a change really need to be? And, and often when we're at the beginning of a change process, we have an initial understanding of the change. We might even have some glimpses of what the change might look like in the end, but we can't really know for sure. And so I think the best way to work all with all of these kinds of resistance is to create what we call a high engagement process, where we involve 
the stakeholders around, you know, what is at stake for them, really understanding uh, uh, what they might lose, but also what they can contribute to it. So it's like it's getting their buy-in. It's getting them energetically enrolled mm -hmm. in this process. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the most important tasks. In the end, I think it's important to understand that a change lives in the people. That doesn't live in the technical processes outside in the when in the end it's the people who need to enact the change. Therefore, it is important to enroll them. And it's also important to know at what point in time you enroll and, and you include what stakeholders. I mean, change is a process that has many steps to it. So thinking through all of those aspects um, is, is uh, an important um, change leadership skill. Uh, that, that needs to be cultivated. And, um, and this, I would just like to say one more thing, is that even a leader who uh, is already clear that a change is needed, he or she may still uh, undergo all of the same experiences of sense of being scared, of ambiguity and loss, and, and uh, needs to work that through themselves and kind of actually model to the rest of the organization how to do it well. We just came back from a leadership festival where it was very clear where leaders very honestly speaking about what truly goes on for them when they step into this place of uncertainty and ambiguity. So it's, it's, there are definitely challenges um, that are associated with it and finding ways to effectively work with these inner process dynamics is part of the biggest change challenges that we have. The topic is fascinating. Your, your insights are valuable, super valuable. David, build on that in our final minutes here. Another concept in this book is called the hijack response. David, give us a minute on what that means in the context of meetings and process. Wow, they're asking a lot there. <laughs> Co or just give us a little bit on the concept of, of cognitive hijacking. Yeah, what uh, neuroscience is showing that um, there are parts of our brain uh, that respond emotionally more quickly than our prefrontal cortex, which responds out of your, our executive function. So if we hear a noise in the house that we think it's a robber or something, you'll immediately respond and not necessarily think about the response. Uh, hijacking is when that uh, amygdala and the emotional self take over and you get triggered by something somebody says that reminds you of a past time when you were afraid or in, in some kind of challenging situation. And in that hijack context, you don't think very clearly. Now, one of our colleagues in the Global Leading Exchange Network, uh, Mary Jelinas, has developed the concept of cognitive hijacking, showing that actually when we get hijacked like this, it does actually distort our thinking in a way. So it's just one of the one of the common things is where it's called the confirmation bias, where you've made a decision and then all you pay attention to are things that support uh, the decision you made. You completely ignore all the other stuff. Um, there are many, many aspects that stem from this hijack phenomenon. I would say one thing I want to build on what Gisela was saying about uh, resistance and leaders, particularly the mistrust of leaders. In this trip we just took through Europe where we were doing uh, workshops on visual consulting, designing leading change in Germany, Vienna, and Italy, and Poland, um, there is a rather substantial movement toward flattening organizations and developing more high engagement organizations stemming from the fact that a lot of younger workers and things just don't want to work for organizations that don't have heart and meaning. So when you're leading in that kind of a context, uh, one of the things that can trigger distrust of people is if you think you have all the answers. And so leaders need to start stepping up to learning how to be learning leaders, uh, people who are as good at listening and modeling listening as they are at telling. And so one of the beautiful things actually about visual facilitation is you are totally modeling your listening because people can see how you listen right there on the wall. But I did want to point out that, that uh, what's going on right now in terms of rethinking organizations is going to require even more high engagement design and more stakeholder involvement and more leaders who understand that. 
that way of working. Right, makes sense. Uh, David, <laughs> all four of your books are rich with these large scale visualizations, including your most recent book as well. I'm not sure what you have at access to you on your, um, on your tablet there, but can you show us some of the work that the Grove does with organizations in terms of your larger scale visualizations and maybe explain one to us on why that's so valuable when you have a, a leadership team and they're moving through a massive change initiative or they're visioning a new strategy, do you have something you can call up and kind of walk us through one and why that's so valuable to the, not just the process in the meeting experience, but next steps as well? Yeah, let me um, find a little file here. And, uh, I know I kind of ambushed you on that, but part of what makes your work so valuable, Gisela, too, is these large-scale visualizations that are just masterpieces in terms of their visual yeah. intrigue, but they help to explain process, complicated change management process so simply for all levels of you know, people in the organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me share with you um, the one that is, is featured in in the book. Um, Sorry, I didn't give you notice for this. Anybody that buys the book will get the benefit of all these different illustrations. <laughs> yeah. This was just a sketch of how you can integrate a change alignment project represented by the big arrow with a vision, which is uh, words hovering over the a vision of a campus. In this case, it's the campus of UC Merced, the latest research university in the University of California. And we went through a process of having the chancellor share her vision this way, then translating it using InDesign uh, into a, an illustrator file and presenting it to her cabinet, at which time it got converted because she uh, didn't like the hub and spoke uh, vision here. She liked the spiral idea. Uh, at the same time, uh, a change alignment group was prioritizing all of the many change projects. This campus is basically going to double in size in four years, and they needed to have a change vision and change alignment process that we facilitated over a period of about nine months. And then as they worked it, we began working up how all the different ways that we could figure out how to include criteria for prioritizing and ended up with this vision um, if you see the swoop on the left, you have to use your imagination here, but there's a 40 foot tall sculpture on campus called Beginnings, which looks like a seed breaking open. And it's two large metal um, arcs. It could almost look like the horns of a steer too. Uh, very, very tall. And we ended up putting the guidelines for project prioritization on this. Turns out that students walk through that sculpture, but to when they enter the campus. So in this case, we have the projects for changing coming through that sculpture and those criteria. Well, coming up with those kinds of links to their meaningful symbols is part of the job. But this continued to evolve and ended up in this in the final vision. Uh, some other nice touches are we, we figured out that the change projects were not the only thing that they needed to pay attention to, but also all the people who do ongoing contribution to the vision and that bridge there is actually a scholar's bridge on the campus that when students graduate, they go across this bridge. Wow. So there's now a picture of the new campus. This over nine months, we used this drawing to be a conceptual container for a large change process that involved the entire campus system. We had small meetings, we had cabinet meetings, we had summit meetings and had many change alignment team meetings. And the whole time, these kinds of visuals were the ones that going through versions allowed them to have a continuous conversation over all that period of time. Mm -hmm. There's really very few processes which are that powerful in terms of holding together a large systemic change process. And that's really what we're uh, unfolding in this book. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a remarkable way of working. It's so remarkable. I mean, it's, it's captivating. It's so visually um, uh, you know, gravitating towards the vision, and you can see how all the uh, uh, you know, iterations of that comes to really bringing to life all this hard work and process and visualization. I think it's a talent that every organization should have at the executive level. How do you take your mastery of the words 
and bring them to life in a visual you know, illustration so that everybody can not just glom onto them, but um, gird to them through the whole process. Gisela, I'm so grateful for your time today. David, thank you for your time. Our time is almost up. I wanna finish talking a bit about the work that The Grove does. And I know you, you publish books. In fact, I encourage everybody to go out and buy visual uh, meetings, visual leaders, visual teams. The new book out just this past week called Visual Consulting. David Tech, talk briefly about some of the work that The Grove Consulting does. You, you, know, you speak, you facilitate yeah. meetings, you're for hire. Give us a sense for that. Well, the, the, the base uh, service that we've been doing for years is graphic meeting facilitation. But right now, one of the strongest areas of growth is, is working with teams and team performance, which is groups of people who are doing projects where you have a series of meetings and they all have to produce results. So if you look at, see the meetings, then teams really are a more encompassing way of thinking about it. We also do a lot of strategic visioning, which is the whole organization figuring out how to coordinate its teams. And mm -hmm. Diesel and I are now working on organization and social change, which is a much more macro way of having all the strategies and all the teams and all the meetings integrate. So if you see it as a, as a set of nested process capabilities, the Grove is able to work across that whole stack, um, mm -hmm. always running visual meetings, but usually connecting these to teams that want to get results in the context of strategies that are clear and lots of stakeholder involvement. And now increasingly, uh, with all of the changes people have to make, um, multi-stakeholder processes are grappling with some of the really big problems of our times. And the Grove has, in fact, taken on uh, big networks of people working on environmental issues and people who are working on uh, community engagement issues. So we work visual meetings, teams, strategic visioning, and change uh, in an integrated holistic way, largely supported by the fact that we think visually. Well, Franklin Covey is a big it fan of the growth. collaboratively. <laughs> yeah, and collaboratively. Gisela, I want to end with you. So, you know, we try to keep our series every week focused on the role of leaders and how do we give mm -hmm. leaders skills that can actually, you know, um, measurably improve their influence and the culture of their organization. As you think about the companies you work with, Gisela, what, what would you leave us with in terms of the role that a leader plays when it comes to communicating vision, managing process change? What, what are some of the, to think about the greatest leaders you've seen, what are some of the defining attributes that you see in them that you might inspire our audience with? Yeah, so um, several leaders come to mind. And um, I really, um, the leaders that I have seen being really successful understand that they cannot uh, drive the change or make the change happen alone that they need to get a team of people involved, that they need, we call it a design team or a change team, and that they need to involve uh, uh, people from across the organization, across levels and functions, as I said, um, uh, in, in, a, in a thoughtful way. And um, yeah, so that's, the, that's what yeah. is primarily stands out to me. Uh, but one, one more thing that comes to mind right now is that it's very helpful for the leader of change to also get support. You know, they might, they might appreciate uh, uh, receiving coaching around the issues that they are facing. We, we talk about this coaching the leader of change because that territory for them is also not something that uh, they necessarily are very comfortable in or understand. So, so for us to have that kind of a relationship with the leader is, can make this, power, this work very, very powerful. Gisela, thank you, very insightful. I'm so grateful for your time today. David, thank you as well. I could spend most of the day with you watching you draw because you're so very talented. I'm so grateful for both of you today. We wish you great success with your new book and my sense is you'll see a lot of book sales because these are very powerful leadership tools. I know a bit about the book business and when I read your books, they're just absolutely like they're meals. They're sumptuous and delicious and so engaging. I wish you both great success. Thank you for joining us today from the Bay Area. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you. And we're glad you all joined us today. We hope you've been inspired a little bit to take some deliberate time as you think about the seven figures, the seven frames, the power 
that graphic facilitation, large scale visualization plays. When you think about your role as a leader, designing change, leading through change, creating a new vision, a new sense of purpose for your organization. We hope you subscribe to the On Leadership series and we'll see you back here next week with a new guest from Franklin Covey. Thanks for joining us.